Well, it appears that white people in the United States got a huge victory from the Supreme Court today. And I'm sure you know what it is. It's concerning affirmative action in the college application process. However, I must warn, I must warn you that this will eventually bite the white majority in the butt down the road. And this might be a blessing in disguise for minority applicants. And I'm going to explain that in this video. So if you're a part of the white majority and you're watching this video, you can go ahead and open up a cold one, drink one down, celebrate. You guys got a big victory today. But like I said, um, this might come back to haunt the white majority probably 20 to 25 years down the road. And I'm going to explain that. Now, my disclaimer, I am an idiot and I'm an idiot in law school. And everything and anything that I talk about in this video is of my own opinion, and I do not speak for any government entity in whole or in part. Why? Because I'm an idiot. Yeah, kids, you got that right. Now, affirmative action as a whole, it really gets a bad rap and a misleading rap because black people are considered to be the face of affirmative action, but people don't understand that the facts do not support that, when in fact it is white women that are the biggest beneficiaries from affirmative action. Now, I'm not going to dive deep into that. You can go do your research, get on Google, get on YouTube, and you can find that for yourself. Now, in the same way that affirmative action is misleading, it's the same thing when it comes to food stamps. Black people, they're the face, or I should say we are the face of the food stamp programs, government handouts, and all of that. When in fact, the numbers show that the biggest beneficiary or the most people that are on food stamps or government assistance, it is white people, the white majority. So hopefully you can kind of understand uh, what I'm saying in that. Now, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to talk about affirmative action as a whole. I'm not going to break down and dissect every uh, minute detail of the Supreme Court case because I am not an attorney yet, and that's not you know what I'm going to do in this video. But I'm just going to talk about affirmative action as a whole because I do believe that this case is going to have a ripple effect for other things that are connected or uh, concern affirmative action. Now, as you guys know, I work... Um, at a place that's kind of considered the Mississippi of the West. And so I've had, you know, several different debates with people, um, basically white coworkers that, um, and some Hispanics that, um, on the subject of affirmative action. And in my opinion, they have a fundamental misunderstanding about affirmative action. Affirmative action, in their opinion, means that somebody can just roll out of bed and they can decide that morning that they want to be a brain surgeon. So all they have to do is just get out of bed, apply for a brain surgeon job. And because they're black or because they're a female or a minority, they're going to get the job. But that's not true. Affirmative action does not support people that are not qualified. In order to benefit from affirmative action, you have to meet all of the standards. You have to meet all of the criteria that is there. You know what I'm saying? It is not some golden Willy Wonka Santa's little helper ticket where, you know, you can truly be unqualified. You don't meet any of the conditions and you somehow get the job. But unfortunately, the narrative that is spread throughout the country is affirmative action supports and upholds people that are not qualified. And that is a ball headed lie. Now, I know on my job, you know, issues related to affirmative action, it, it's very controversial because you'll have uh, when black people um, get jobs or promotions, which it doesn't happen too often on my job. But when it does happen, it seems like the go to um, response is, oh, they must have filed or, oh, they must have filed an EEO complaint or they filed on their supervisor and that's how they got the job. You know, it's never that you know, the black staff member or whatever, um, they were competent, qualified, and capable. It's just they got it because of the fruits of their labor related to filing paperwork. Now, I know for one instance, right, uh, there's a brother on the job. He just recently got a true promotion. Now, several months ago, um, he got a uh, lateral promotion, which was a decent situation for him, but he got that a few months ago. So now a few weeks ago, he just got a, uh, a, a actual true promotion with more money. And when I say they was hating, they was hating on that brother. Now this dude, now what they don't understand is this brother, he is highly educated. I mean, I'm not going to go into the specifics, you know, for his privacy, but this dude is highly educated. Well, it appears. 
He has all different types of certifications. Um, he has a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. And I want to say that he might even be getting ready to start his doctorate or, or he might almost be done with it. So this brother, he is not a slacker by no, this dude is highly educated, but the narrative was, oh, he must have filed to get the job. You know, so what I'm telling you, it's real. I'm not making this up. It's just when, when, when brothers and sisters, when they get jobs, it's not because, you know, we were smart enough or we were the best candidate. It's because we filed. So affirmative action, it's just inherently a very controversial and a hot button topic. But of course, you know, where I work, I don't think a lot of the people are aware that the biggest beneficiaries concerning affirmative action as a whole, it is white women. They are the biggest beneficiaries. And I kind of want to go back real quick just to drive it home that affirmative action does not give an unqualified person and a person that does not meet the standards, it does not give them a Willy Wonka ticket to get a job. You have to be competitive. You have to meet all of the standards and the requirements. And I don't know who started this rumor or who started this theory, but you know, the rumor is that, you know, affirmative action just gives you this Willy Wonka ticket and you could just get whatever job you want, even if you're not qualified. Like I gave the example of the brain surgeon. If I rolled out of bed today and I said, I want to be a brain surgeon and I just go down and I show my skin, hey, look. Hey, I want to be a brain surgeon. Look, man, a brain surgeon. And then they're going to give me the job because of affirmative action. That is not true. That's not how it works. But again, when you have a lot of ignorant people that spread information, misinformation like the gospel, and then you have people that don't fact check things, or you have people that don't take the time to research, they'll just believe whatever they hear, you know, that creates problems. And of course, we know people are going to believe whatever they hear. That's why when it comes to campaign seasons, you know, you have um, candidates, they spend billions of dollars when it's campaign season time because they know people are going to believe what's on the boob tube. They're going to believe whatever comes in the mail, whatever comes on the commercials. They're not going to research. They're not going to fact check. They're not going to do any of it. If it sounds good, if it seems like it might be on track, they'll believe it. And, and you know, that's it's an unfortunate truth. Now, I want to segue into how, you know, this major victory for the white majority in today's society will end up biting them in the butt 20 to 25 years from now. So, you know, there's been numerous studies and statistics that have come out and it's said, you know, repeatedly that within the next 20 to 25 years, the uh, white majority in the country, they will then slide to the minority slot. So um, I don't know. I think it would be Hispanics, I think, that would be in the majority at that point, I, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I do know that the white majority, that is the majority now, they would slide to the minority. And as we know, um, there's a lot of uh, conservatives, a lot of white folks, a lot of people on the right. They don't like affirmative action. A lot of them now, not everybody. So let me let me backtrack. I don't want to lump everybody into the group. However, you know, it is the conservative right movement. They do not like affirmative action. They do not like any types of government programs or anything that appears to give somebody an upper hand or whatever the case may be. They feel like it's unfair and you should just be given a job based on, you know, the, the merits of your efforts and your hard work. Now, you guys remember when Trump um, got in office on the first go round and as quiet as it was kept, he was um, they were nominating and they were appointing a gang of judges in the federal courts. Right. And those judges, um, majority of them were white, young conservatives now. And, and not only that, but Trump, I think he appointed three conservative Supreme Court justices. Now, the theory behind that, and it all ties together with what I'm talking about in this video. So the theory behind Trump, you know, appointing all of these white conservative young judges, as well as the Supreme Court um, conservatives, is to secure the power for the future. Because as I said previously, that it is estimated in the next 20 to 25 years that the white majority is going to slide to the minority role. So since they know that the inevitable is coming and they can't stop it, you know, they're they're playing chess. And I, I mean, hey, it is what it is. They 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 doing it smart. Right. So what they're doing is they're trying to secure the power seats. You know, who runs the country? It's the people that's in the power seats. So for your judges, you know, your Supreme Courts, 
all those different things. They want to keep it as conservative as possible and keep them young, which, you know, would presume that they would live a long life. And so the theory is once that swap happens where the minority, where the whites become the minority, it won't necessarily matter, you know, as it'll matter, but it won't be like just the end of the world because they will still hold the power in the court systems and they will still hold the power on the Supreme Courts. Now, this is not, now let me make this clear, right? This is not some original thought that I came up with. You know, this is from, you know, other people have been talking about this. Now, of course, they're not going to talk about this in mainstream media because, you know, that that's not productive for them or it doesn't fit their agenda. But this is something that, um, it's been discussed quite often because I can't remember off the top of my head, but Trump quietly, he appointed a gang of young white conservative judges in the federal system, as well as, of course, we know the three Supreme Court justices. So it appears that they're already working. The Supreme Court is already, you know, doing the conservative bidding. You know, they uh, overrode uh, Roe v. Wade, which, of course, we know that landmark decision. And here's something that's funny. Uh, what is it? Stare decisi, and I'm probably not pronouncing it right, but it's basically a term that just talks about precedence, right? And that usually courts are not into the business of overturning previous judges unless it's like something that's like legitimate. So in theory, right, once a rule is made, the judges usually will honor that rule. But as we can see, stare decisi, it's not, it's clearly not what we thought it was because Roe v. Wade was policy that was in the books, for, well, I should say law, that was in the books for years, years, and years, decades, and now it was overturned. So as we can see, you know, that is something, and of course, we know the uh, Second Amendment case where it struck down, I think it was out of New York. Um, the issues, you know, where some cities and states, they make it very, very difficult for people to carry firearms, so the Supreme Court struck that down. Then, of course, today they did affirmative action. So you can kind of see that there might be some truth to that theory because there are a lot of conservative things that are um, finally coming to pass or now they're finally passing things that are supporting that. So although today was a victory for the white majority, I can say, you know, be warned that once the white majority transitions to the white minority, all of these things that, you know, they're trying to overturn and do, you know, it's going to come to bite them in the butt and they're going to try to, you know, reverse or redo some of these things. And just think about it. I mean, it really does. It's plausible. You know, it's plausible. Now, this video, obviously, this is not meant for me. I'm not a racist at all. I'm just talking about all of, you know, the things that are relevant to this case, because although this deals with affirmative action and um, college uh, admissions process, you know, it's still attacking the affirmative action framework. You know what I'm saying? It's almost, well, I won't use that term, but yeah, it, it, it's, you start it off real small and you build, it's like a snowballing effect. Does that make sense? So all of the programs that the conservative right um, just cannot stand and they hate all of these programs that seem to benefit, you know, minority groups and whatnot, all of those programs that they hate now, 20 to 25 years from now, they're going to try to embrace it. I mean, just think about it because right now they're the majority. So they feel like, you know, just because they might lose a few slots on jobs or whatever, they think it's the end of the world. And so we got to stop this. We got to stop this. Right. But once they transition to the minority, now they're going to be on the other side of things. So naturally, because when you become the minority, you're going to feel the weight of an unfair system or you're going to feel the weight of things that are just imbalanced, that things that just do not seem fair. So as a result, when you feel the weight of that, you are going to speak out and you are going to lash out and you are going to do other things, you know what I'm saying, to try to combat that. So it's it's going to be it's going to be a a, a satirish, uh, hilarious um, role of reversal, if you will, or reverse of roles, whatever, whatever you choose to do, tomato, tomato. But this, this Supreme Court case, I mean, it definitely is a big deal because again, even though it's only dealing with, um, uh, the college admissions process, it's still attacking the framework and the foundation of affirmative action. And who knows, there might be some other things down the road to come. Now, I already know, I, I work with some people. They're going to report this video. They're going to call Crime Stoppers. Hey, Gillespie, we got him. He's talking about white people. We got him. 
He's talking about white people calling the National Guard. We got him. But no, you don't have me. This is something that is being talked about throughout the country. I mean, we're dealing with you know, uh, tenants involving affirmative action in the college admissions process and how that's going to have ripple effects throughout the country. And then I believe there was another major victory too for, um, now I don't think this really has anything to do with race. This is more about religion where I think a man, um, I think he was working for the postal service and they wanted him to work on Sundays. And he was like, I don't want to work on Sundays. It's the Lord's day. And so he fought and he fought and he eventually won. Um, I don't, again, I don't know the intricate details of the case, so I can't really comment too much on it. I want to say he even lost his job at some point, but that was a major victory. But all of these different Supreme Court cases, they're going to have, um, it's going to cause a ripple effect throughout the country. And no matter how you try, there's no way to talk about affirmative action without talking about race and other sensitive topics that some people don't like to talk about. So although you might try to call Crime Stoppers and you might try to paint me as um, a racist or whatever your agenda is, you're just wasting your time. The stuff that I'm talking about, it is legitimate stuff that was hashed out in the courts. And again, even though this deals with the college admissions process, you, you already know that it, it's setting the foundation for other things as well that's going to unravel. All right, yeah, so I just pulled it up on my phone real quick. So it said, the U.S. Supreme Court unanimously handed a major victory to religious groups by greatly expanding how far employers must go to accommodate the religious views of their employees. And I remember I was listening to one on the radio this morning, and prior to whatever um, the standard they do have now, they only had to use a de minimis test, which I'm not a lawyer, I'm not providing legal advice or legal analysis, but prior to this major victory, um, employers did not have a high bar to show that, you know, a person's religious beliefs conflicted with or, you know, caused some type of undue burden or undue harm to the employer. But now with this case, the bar has been set substantially higher. So, of course, obviously that's good for a person that has, you know, deeply held religious beliefs. And then that makes it hard for, you know, employers. So, like I said, these Supreme Court cases, they're going to have um, some deep ramifications and it's going to cause ripple effects throughout the country. But like I said, although um, the white majority received a huge victory today, I would say you're only going to have a little bit of time to celebrate that victory because once you slide to the minority role, if it, you know, if the estimates are true within 20 to 25 years, now you're going to be in the minority role and now you're going to feel the weight of what you're going to feel is an unfair system or a rigged system. And then you'll start talking about systemic racism, all those different things. And that's just the irony of all of this. And again, this is just having a healthy dialogue. You know what I'm saying? Whenever black folks talk about systemic racism or they talk about issues that are systemic to hold black folks down, all of those different things. Once the 20 to 25 years come and the minority is the white uh, majority that's now, they're going to start saying the same things. Now, I'm not advocating for, oh yeah, let's make them pay. And I'm not for that. You know what I'm saying? Everybody should have an equal shot to be able to pursue, you know, their lives, to pursue their profession, whatever they want to do. You know, everybody should have an equal opportunity. Now, I'm not saying that um, you should have a leg up or you should have an advantage. All I'm saying is the playing field should be fair for everybody. Now, if it's fair for everybody, then obviously there's going to be some winners and there's going to be some losers. You can't stop that. That's just, that's life. However, you know, the color of your skin or your um, religious affiliation or whatever that is, it should not come into effect when, you know what I'm saying, you're with how you're being treated, if that makes sense. But I do think that is ironic because I could see it now, 20, 30 years from now, you're going to have uh, the white folks that they're going to start talking about systemic racism. They're going to start talking about feeling the weight of an unfair system. Now, on the flip side, now, that'll also be dependent on if the courts change, because like I said right now, now I don't know how many justices Biden has been appointing things to try to reverse some of that. I have no idea, but I do know that some of the rhetoric that is being used now by minorities, you know, come 20, 30 years from now, white folks are going to be using those same talking points and those same buzzwords and all of that stuff, man. So, you know, the irony of it all, but I'm gonna wrap this up. I'm not trying to go too long, but whenever you get a chance, um, 
check out some videos on, you know, the biggest beneficiaries concerning affirmative employment or concerning all of these different things. And you're going to be pleasantly surprised because I can be honest to say, I didn't even know until a few years ago that white women and um, I can't remember, I can't remember the source. It was several different sources that I was, you know, researching, but I can admit myself, I didn't even know that um, white women were the uh, biggest uh, beneficiaries as it related to the affirmative action framework. So enjoy the victory now, you know, chug one up, have a good time, celebrate. But 20 to 30 years from now, you know, it's going to be a different story. And, you know, the justices could change by so many things could change between now and then, you know what I'm saying? But if, you know, I were to predict anything, I would predict that all of the things that, you know, minorities are saying now and that the right conservatives are pushing against those conservatives on the right, they're going to flip roles and they're going to be start talking about the weight of an unfair system. So until the next video, holla at your boy.